Christian, you say that God is love. Why then doesn't God put a stop to evil? Have you ever wondered that as a Christian? And if you're not a Christian, have you felt like this is one of the reasons that I don't think Christianity has a leg to stand on? Like this doesn't make sense to me. What are the sorts of situations that trigger a question like that, right? I mean, it's if there is a natural disaster or if there is a fire and somebody dies in the house fire, if there is a, a mother who's looking forward to having a child but the baby is stillborn, someone's a victim of crime, someone is a victim of abuse. Like, we see these things that are horrific. And we all can find ourselves asking, like, where are you, God? Or is there a God? Or if there is a God, why aren't you doing anything about it, right? I mean, that is a very natural question that comes into people's minds when we face tragedy. People have questions then about the nature of God, the heart of God, the power of God. And we're going to start off by looking at a couple of just very succinct, short Bible verses that tell us what God is like. And then we'll try to put some pieces together. Let's start off in Psalm 115, verse 3. So Psalm 115, verse 3. Um, you know that when, if you're doing this electronically, it doesn't matter. But um, if you have a, a paper Bible, you can find the book of Psalms by basically opening it up halfway. And there, there it is. There is Psalms. Here's what it says. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. Now look at Psalm 33, verse 5. Psalm 33, verse 5. That one. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Unfailing love does whatever pleases him. Like all powerful. All powerful and loving. Those are the two things that get pitted against each other when we face something that is tragic, right? Or evil. When unbelievers would try to choose between, let's say, God is powerful and loving. No, I don't think he's loving. Or would they say, God is powerful and loving. No, I don't think he's powerful. In other words, when evil strikes, you think you have to pick one of those, but you can't choose both of them. Either God is powerful, but not loving, or he is loving, but he's not very strong. Which of the options do you think a non-believer would prefer? Where do they go to first, and why? There might be some that think God has to be loving, but then he must not be in control of everything. I wonder, though, if maybe more people are sort of willing to, at least for the sake of argument, grant that God is all-powerful. But if he really is all-powerful, then he can't be loving, given what we see happening in our world today. Why is it that people feel that way? about God. I think they conclude that the divinity has to be supernaturally incredible. That seems, if you're going to go with one, maybe the one that has to be true. And if, in fact, he's not doing anything, then that would make you wonder, like, that he's not loving. In fact, maybe he even is the source of evil, and that's where that causes a huge dilemma for Christians because they're thinking, wait a second, the God that is revealed to us in the Holy Scriptures, in the Bible, is incredibly loving. So if someone has concluded that God is powerful but not loving, and I as a Christian know that God is loving, I confess it every day. What do I say? How can I answer someone who has posed to me the dilemma of evil? Let's look at a few more Bible verses. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. This is the very beginning of time, right? God saw all that he had made. He had created the world and men and women, man and woman. God saw all that he has made, and it is, it was very good. Very good. 
Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one person and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. When God made the world, it was very good. Paul in Romans says that when sin entered the world through one person, and he's talking about Adam, the first man, the one who was responsible for the spiritual care of his family. When Adam surrendered and gave in, and took a bite of the fruit, along with his wife, human beings brought rebellion into the world. God made it perfect. Humans brought the rebellion in. And now turn to, Rome, to Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 and 8. Hebrews 8, verses 7 and 8. Now the background of this is a little more complicated. Jesus is talking about how there was an arrangement he had set up for his Old Testament family, the Israelites, we call that the Old Covenant, and he had expectations for them, and they were supposed to follow his expectations. But the fact was, that didn't work out. And so God has a new covenant now that is being discussed here that is going to show itself in the coming of the Messiah who would pay for all sin. So an Old Covenant, that one didn't work out. The New Covenant, a covenant of forgiveness through Christ. Listen to this, verse 7. If there had been nothing wrong with the First Covenant, then no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, then there would have been no need for another. But God found fault with the people. So if there's something wrong with the first covenant, a part of you might and me might be thinking, well, the like who wrote the covenant? It must have been flawed in some way. And you'd say, well, God wrote the, the covenant. So if there was something that didn't work out with the first covenant, it must have been the person that wrote it that was at fault. But God in the book of Hebrews says he found fault with the people. The problem wasn't with the perfect design. The problem was that the people did not obey God's perfect design. So here you have a choice. Is God the problem or are people the problem? And God explicitly says people are the problem. Now, you can just say, well, like, here's God, you know, talking about himself. I'm not going to believe that. So we realize somebody can just call God a liar totally here with what's being said in the Bible. But if one hears what's being said in the Bible, the world was created and it was very good. Human beings broke up, exploded this perfect world with their rebellion against God. And we know when there's a theoretical, hmm, who's at fault here, God or people? God is never hesitant to pin the blame directly on people. With that in mind, it would seem impossible to blame God for evil. And yet it happens. The question is, what logic is required in order to ultimately pin the blame back on God? Like, what do you have to be thinking to somehow get there when it seems so obvious that God did everything loving and it was the people that messed up? Well, like, one thing you have to start with is just this instinctive, no, I'm not going to admit that I'm wrong. It's got to be someone else's fault. Have you ever run into anything like that just on an earthly level? right? I mean, this is what humans do. Like, it's horrible. But how quickly don't we, even if we know we're guilty, try to find someone else to blame? So a big part of this isn't whether it makes sense that we're accusing God of evil. It's just the instinct of our wicked, sinful flesh. I mean, what else might lead someone to think, well, it's got to be God's fault. I mean, maybe you could frame it in some way like, in a way like this, where you'd say, well, like, if God hadn't let the devil fall into sin, then, you know, Adam and Eve wouldn't have even had a, had a chance to sin, maybe? And uh, when you hear questions like that, like, if, well, basically saying it's God's fault, like he let it happen, or it's God's fault, he let Adam and Eve sin, it's God's fault. 
Perhaps it's helpful to think of a question like this. Imagine that you have a man and a woman and they've been faithful to each other for their entire marriage. And someone goes up to the man and says, were you faith unfaithful to your wife again? Were you unfaithful to your wife again? Yes or no? Like, what's that man thinking? He's been faithful to his wife his entire life. And the question is, were you unfaithful to your wife again? He's thinking, again, like, what are you implying? No, give me a yes or no. Like, that person cannot answer that question, yes or no, because the question has embedded in it a presumption that's false. It's not true that he was ever unfaithful to his wife before. When you are stuck with a question that has in it an assumption that is not true, what do you do? Well, what is the assumption that is not true? When we ask, why didn't God keep the devil from sinning? Or why didn't God keep Adam and Eve from sinning? Turn to James chapter 1, verses 13 to 18. James chapter 1, verses 13 to 18. Here's how it goes. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is, is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. James 1, 13 to 18. You might remember, just as you were listening, what does it say God doesn't do? It says he doesn't tempt anyone. He does not try to get someone to get into trouble. People are tempted to sin by their own sinful desires. So what we know God doesn't do is he has no intention to introduce evil into a perfect situation. If there's a, a fault, a finger to be pointed, it's at the human being who falls into sin. What is true about God? It says every good and perfect gift comes from above. That whatever is true about God, it's always, or whatever God does, maybe we should say, it's always good and it's always perfect. God is never, never the source of evil. Now again, you might say, well, like, how can we trust that? Like, maybe the Bible's lying. And, right, I mean, when one acknowledges what the scripture is saying, and let's just try to put the scripture's pieces together to understand what it's trying to say, what it is stating is that God is never the source of evil. So, were you unfaithful to your spouse again? Again, false presumption. What is the false presumption when we say, well, like, why didn't God stop the devil from sinning? Or, why didn't God keep Adam and Eve from falling into sin? Or something like that, right? We have in that question the presumption that it's possible that God could be responsible for evil. We're envisioning that as a possibility when we're asking the why. We have put into a question something that is impossible. It's false. God cannot be the source of evil. Well, yes or no? You see how you can't answer a question that is wrongly framed? But there's more. The role that God does play in evil, right? Like, he's there. What's he doing when there's evil? If, if I'm not going to say he's the cause in a guilty sort of way of evil, then... Romans chapter 9, verses 22 to 24 takes us another, another step. Romans, 20, Romans 9, 22 to 24. 
Now, Romans 9 has got some complexity to it, and it's important to know, first off, just one of the parts of the preceding context is an account of Pharaoh. So Pharaoh was an evil man. He was persecuting the Jews, and in the end, Pharaoh is put on the losing side as God opens up the waters of the Red Sea and the Israelites escape, right? But the question is this, with Pharaoh, why did he continue to exist? Well, in the end, by Pharaoh's continued existence and he's fighting against God, but then God brings miraculous rescue, the good name of God got spread far and wide. Do you remember Rahab? She was the prostitute in the city of Jericho that helped out Israel's two spies. The exodus from Egypt had happened 40 years before that, and she knew about the parting of the Red Sea. The name of God had been glorified because Pharaoh had opposed and God ultimately overcame. So with that in mind, what if God, verse 22, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, so he was intending to bring just, justice and judgment on Pharaoh and his army, but choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, what if God bore with great patience the objects of his wrath, like a Pharaoh, who was fit for destruction, thoroughly made ready for destruction. He deserved punishment. What if God bore with great patience someone like that in order to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy whom he prepared in advance for glory? What if God had a purpose in being patient with the Pharaoh situation because he ultimately was going to bring even greater glory to his name. The role of God and evil. One more thing. Romans 11, 32 and 33. So you can just flip your pages ahead or scroll just a little bit further. Having looked at this, and having identified the role of God and highlighting for people the fact that they have fallen short of God's expectations, people have broken God's law, Verse 32, for God has bound all men over to disobedience. He has made it evident to all that they are completely lost based on their own actions. Bound all men over to, to disobedience so that he might have mercy on them all. That God's intent in highlighting sinfulness is ultimately that they might see their sin and they might see in mind-blowing fashion the undeserved mercy of God in Christ who came to forgive sin. And it's at that moment that Paul says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Sometimes we get confused by, well, but how then can there be evil you see what God says is really confusing? If you really want your head to explode, try to explain why God, in the face of rejection and rebellion, chose to tell Adam and Eve that he was going to send a Savior into the world who was going to crush Satan's head and bring forgiveness for their sin. Like that makes no sense. Why would God show love is it to some degree a mystery, the presence of evil? Do our minds struggle to wrap our heads around that? Like, it's okay to say there are things that you can't connect the dot dots on perfectly according to your human reason. Like, it's okay to be an ant, an ant, the little animal ant, and to observe humans walking by. How would an ant have a conversation about what constitutes human speech? Like, what are they doing right now? Right? We don't even imagine an ant being able to have thoughts like that. The fact is that the gap between us and ants is so small compared to the gap between God and us. And yet sometimes we feel like we are capable of comprehending or thinking through or, right, God's ways. And, and if we're willing to say, yeah, like I struggle sometimes with, with evil and my head wants to blame God. I want to think in some way that it's his fault. And I hear the Bible and it tells me that is not true. Like that's the one answer that for sure is wrong. There, there may be uh, lots of 
true things that could be said, which we don't know how to say them because we're just a little ant and God is great. But, but let me tell you this. There's one thing that you can say that even you should know is wrong, that God is responsible for evil. Right? Like maybe there are things that blow our mind. But if that does blow our mind, like that's nothing compared to what should really blow our minds. And that is that as enemies brought into the world wickedness, God's reaction was compassion and mercy and love. How do you explain that? What's beautiful is that God is not unaware of evil. The fact is that he powerfully works in the face of evil. If we can say our accusation that God is the problem here is more evidence of our pride, our arrogance, the fact that we just think we can say, well, you know, God must be wrong. And, and you know how, how wrong that is. Um, like even in our own society, there have been discussions about if a, if a teenager commits a crime, are the parents responsible? And there are times where judges and Juries, and they all might look at the situation and say, well, this is, a, this is a case where plainly there was a contribution to the act of this teenager by the parent, right? We will pray that judges and juries make authentic, loving, proper, just decisions in that regard. But what if someone were to say to you, any time a teenager does something wrong, it's the parent's fault. Like, you know, there are times when the parents have done everything they can and the they're not responsible, but if it's just like an automatic free pass to say, well, I, I want to blame whoever I want, and if I don't think I should be busted for it, then, then you must all agree with me that the person I'm blaming is blameworthy, right? We would not be comfortable with that in our justice system. And yet we can do the very thing to God. Like we, we can just assume that, well, it must be, he's the one that must be the problem, right? When, when we hear the scripture so clearly telling us that, well, whatever the answer is, that's one that's for sure wrong. And now you're wondering, okay, like, help me, help me understand how a powerful God interacts with evil. There are three big words that, that you can remember. The first one, if you look at Psalm 81, Psalm 81, verses 11 and 12, Psalm 81, verses 11 and 12. The psalmist here is talking about how the nation of Israel rebelled against God. And so the Lord, in response, he says, My people would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own devices. He gave them over. He said, If you want to rebel against me, go right ahead. It's all yours. And you might say, Whoa, that's weakness on the part of God. No, that's, that's judgment on the part of God. When someone's inclinations are toward evil, and ultimately, because of repeated rejection, God says, go your own way. What a horrific, while you're still alive, condemnation, judgment from God. Because the one who's doing evil is not bringing benefit to themselves. They're hurting themselves. And if God's judgment is, all right, if you're going to hurt yourself, I guess you're going to hurt yourself even more, right? This is horrific. And what if those individuals are committing sins? You might be thinking, wait a second, it's God's judgment on them that they're going to be doing it even more. This is, this is in Romans, right? Romans chapter 1 talks about a very similar thing where people refused to acknowledge God as creator of the world. And so then God handed them over to the desires of their hearts where there was inappropriate relations between men and women, but men and a woman, man and a woman, Right? And then as they were comfortable with that kind of immorality, then God handed them over to unnatural immorality. Like if you're going to turn your back on me in that way even more, then I hand you over to unnatural immorality. Where now it's men with men and women with women. And then after that, even more. And now they're disobeying their parents at will and just every kind of evil that's coming. One of the worst things that God can do to someone as a judgment is to let them do what they want to do according to their wicked sinful flesh. 
And when there's sinful actions, like disobeying parents, bring pain to parents. And now parents are saying, like, I'm the victim of evil. My children are rebelling against me. And it's God himself who handed the children over to something like that as a consequence for other rebellion. Does it feel like God is bringing evil into our lives? With evil, there is a place for what we can call God's permission. He allows evil to play out. In these cases, there's a judgment involved with the evil that is playing out. That is judgment on those who are doing evil. Now, there might be a part of you that says, wait a second, you're, you're punishing them, but I'm the victim of this disrespectful child. And here is where the question comes up. Who's hurting more? When people are victims of crimes, it is tragic and it hurts. And we are eager to do whatever we are able, emotionally, physically, to assist someone who has been the victim of a crime. As that person's personal needs are met, as a Christian, they can know that they are not the one who is really hurting. The one who is really hurting is the one who has committed the crime. They are in such big trouble, and they might not even know it. When evil plays out, it does not mean that a Christian is now all alone floating in the middle of nowhere to be pummeled and victimized and all of the rest. Can bad happen to Christians in an ungodly world? Yes. But a Christian has confidence that a loving God is still in control. And what is that loving God doing? Well, one of the things he can do is actually keep something from happening to one of his children. A great example of that is Lot in the city of Sodom, right? When enemies of the city came to the door of Lot when he had welcomed guests who were actually angelic beings into his home and the people outside wanted to have sinful relations with the people inside and God struck them blind so they could not. Another time, Elisha's running away from an enemy army and he's in the city of Dothan. The enemy army surrounds the city. What does God do? He sends an army of angels. And the whole army becomes blind. So that Elisha goes out to the army and says, it looks to me like you're a little lost. And then they follow him. He leads them into the capital city of the Israelites, where the king of the Israelites sees all of these enemies inside his city and realizes he can slaughter them. He asks like for permission, basically. And Elisha tells him, no, throw him a party. Like, seriously, throw him a party. And so he did. And all of these enemies, they went back home and they did not attack Israel again. Like, God has had his own way. But what was he doing? Protecting by preventing evil from happening. So sometimes, God actually steps in and makes sure that something can't happen. Another situation like this is when Job, right, and the devil and God and the devil was saying to God, you know, Job loves you, well, because you just made him rich. And and God says, well, like, you can see that it's not for that reason. You can, you can take anything away from him. Just don't touch his body. And so the devil made all sorts of horrible things happen by the permission of God in order to highlight the powerful faith God had given to Job. But God said, you can only go this far. And then it was, and then the next time you can touch his body but not kill him, right? God was there making sure that the line didn't get crossed. But you might be saying, okay, that's really nice when God prevents evil from happening, but I'm not one of those people. I'm one of those people who has experienced evil. So you're telling me that God can permit it and he can prevent it. And in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, if there was ever someone who could say, why isn't God doing anything? It was Joseph. Brothers had sold him into slavery, then gets accused in his master's house of being inappropriate with the wife of the master. 
He didn't do anything. She lied about it. He gets thrown into prison. I mean, can you see Joseph in prison saying, like, what's the deal? I'm, I've been a follower of the Lord, and what in the world is happening to me, right? But Genesis 50, 20 has the brothers who had sold him into slavery scared to death. You're wondering, how in the world could they have become scared to death? Well, God ultimately made Joseph second in command of all Egypt, and the brothers are now in front of him, and they are scared. Because now they know that he knows what they have done, and they are certain that they are going to face their end in some horrible way. Do you know what Joseph says to them? I know, like, God lost control here. There was a ton of evil. You guys are going to pay now. Now I can squeeze out of you all the justice that God refused to give. Like, are there times when you feel that way? You just so much want God's justice to pour down on somebody who has hurt you. And you have wondered, where is my good and gracious God? How can you be both powerful and loving when something like this has happened? Joseph could have said. Do you know what he said? To his brothers, you intended to harm me. But God intended this for good, for the saving of many lives, as Joseph had collected food for the starving. My friends, God has given to you a Christian, a child of the Heavenly Father, the absolute promise that he will work everything out for your good, even if it involves you experiencing evil. I know that can feel mind-blowing. I know that can seem impossible. You have God's word on it, even if it takes multiple years for Joseph finally to see how this plays out. For some of us, maybe it won't be until we're in heaven. And who knows what exactly we'll get as far as detail. We'll just be so thrilled by that point. God as powerful God, in the face of evil, can permit it, and in fact even sometimes use it to further the judgment of someone. He can prevent it, and he directs it, ultimately for the good of those who love him, his children. Your God is not weak. And yet sometimes there is in your heart that longing for justice. Dear Lord, pr please bring justice. Particularly when the evil that you're experiencing has been inflicted on you by someone else, right? I mean, there are different kinds of evil we face. There are tornadoes and hurricanes and unexpected health issues. And like where we would not be positioned by God to say, Oh, this is God punishing you for a particular sin, right? We realize that so much of what happens is just a part of being in this sinful world. And though we know God can bring consequences for particular sins, as a Christian, we know that God punished Jesus for all of my sins. So, like, I don't want to think that for a whole ton of, ton of reasons. But sometimes, sometimes the tragedies we face can feel, like, inanimate. Like, they're outside things that affect us. And sometimes the evil that we face can be because a person has directly sinned against us. And we might so long for all of that to go away for the evil that's just a part of being in the sinful world, for the evil that comes to us because of evil people. Mark chapter 9, verse 48. Mark chapter 9, verse 48. This is talking about the consequence of rebellion against God, a, a picture of hell, and here's how it's described. This is a place where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. There is justice for evil. Right? That's what concerns us when we think, like, where is my loving God? We've seen how our loving God can work miraculously, even in the face of evil happening. But please know this. There will be justice. There will be justice. Fire never going out, worm not dying. That may be a new image to you. It's also in the book of Isaiah. 
but the idea of a worm that is a decomposing body, right? And it never runs out of food, that worm. Whatever hell is, it is perpetual. It is horrific and it never stops. There will be justice. And now the only question that might come into your mind is, but I want it more quickly. It's so hard to wait. I know you're asking me to trust, but I'm hurting now. 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 7. 2 Peter 3, verses 7 to 9. You're going to hear a word that we just heard, fire. Verse 7, 2 Peter 3. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Fire, destruction of ungodly people. Do not worry. There will be justice. But, if you're counting the days, and you so wish it was happening right now, your God says, do not forget this one thing. Dear friends, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. And God's timetable does not match ours. And we may say it's been so long and from the perspective of God it has been very short. He says the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. Do you know why God hasn't ended the world yet and brought justice in the most profound way possible upon all who are evil? He doesn't want people to go to hell. He is patient. There are more people to be saved. If you had a choice between having it all end right now and more people ending up in hell. Or God gives it more time so that there are more who are brought to repentance and see in Jesus their Savior and end up in heaven. People who would have been in hell but now are in heaven because of the powerful gospel that you can share with them. Here is the question. Are you willing to live in a world where there will be evil so that someone else can be in heaven. Of course. Dear Lord, help us be patient in the face of suffering. Help us remember that when we experience evil, natural disaster, or perpetrated by someone, you are there to work even the worst for our best. You prevent whenever you determine that is necessary. But all the while you are being patient, not having the final justice come, which will come, because there are more to be brought into the family of believers. Isn't that incredible? Our God is powerful and our God is loving. And when the question comes to you, right, how can a God you say is love allow there to be evil in the world? And there is that wrong implication that God could be guilty of something, which he can't. But you want to patiently help a person to the point that by God's grace he has brought you. We had our three questions. First to agree with them, then to have you them agree with you, and then ask if you can tell them a story. How about this? What situations have made you feel that God can't be loving? Like, I'm sure they have a story to tell, something that would break your heart. Give them a chance. Then, ask them, do you think that parents should always be punished when a teenage child commits a crime? We talked about that one already. It's an entry point into a discussion of how, like, blame shifting... Like even we have a problem with that. 
and maybe it will give you the chance to say, I know our instinct is to think it must be someone else's problem, not ours, why there is evil in the world. It must be a God problem, not a humanity problem. And you can work through that and speak about maybe the personal sin we all have, which follows the sin of Adam and even how all the, the evil that is a part of this world was a consequence of what happened there. And, and then this. Could I tell you a story about what might be the biggest seeming failure by God to show love? Could I tell you a story of what is the biggest apparent moment of failure where God's love seemed to be letting someone down? The biggest? Like, you're serious? Yeah, the biggest. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, God, who was perfect, who had never done anything wrong, was getting treated in the most wicked, evil, perverse way. And he even asked, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Like, where is the God of love at this moment? This is unjust, this is cruel, this is wicked, this is evil epitomized. This is the worst in a single moment. Yeah. Where is the love of God on the cross? And yet, that was the greatest love that was ever shown. Where God himself came to earth, took on human flesh, took our sin, Adam and Eve's, and everyone who has sinned after, and made it his own. He suffered an, a just penalty that is horrific, we cannot even imagine. But on that cross, he paid the price for the sin of the entire world. Do you know what happened in connection with that evil? Your sins have been paid for. Every one of them. Can God work blessing in the midst of the biggest apparent defeat? Oh, did he work blessing. That is the God who loves you. How can God be loving when there is evil in this world? Yes, there are many things that simply go beyond our capacity to connect the dots. But this is what I know. This is what you know. This is what God assures us we can be confident of. God loves you. He shows it in so many ways in the face of evil and in the greatest act of evil ever. God, so powerful, showed the greatest act of love ever. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you would work in us trust. You do love us. Please graciously work all things for our good, helping us through this earthly life, which is full of trouble and sorrow, helping us be patient, that more would be saved, giving us confidence that one day justice will come, that more blessed, that we might be saved, justice applied to Jesus, so that justice need not be applied to me. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.